You're listening to the First Baptist Rockdale Sunday Sermons Podcast. First Baptist Rockdale is a church dedicated to making disciples who make disciples. We hope you enjoy this week's message. Well, we've been walking through the beginning part of the book of Genesis. We are continuing that path. So if you have your Bible, you can open to Genesis chapter 9 today, Genesis chapter 9. Now, we remember, if you were here last week, uh, we just went through um, what is uh, the Noah's Flood epic, right? Noah um, was, was picked out of all of humanity as the one person who was living a somewhat righteous life, and God preserved all of human life through him and animal life. And so we had Noah and the ark and the two-by-two two animals. We had all of that happen, and God is totally starting creation over again, right? We're, we're, we're starting again a new new animals or, or just, just pairs of animals to, to start a seed, just a couple of people um, to begin again. And as we look at what's going on in, in, in um, Genesis chapter 9, we see uh, an elevation of this concept of life. You know, it would be easy for us to think that God holds life as something relatively trivial, right? God breathes into mankind and life exists. And then at the decree of God, everything that was living ceased to live except for those few things on the ark, right? So, so life uh, could look to be relatively trivial to God that he can create and destroy and create and destroy as much as he wants. But God in this passage is going to elevate Life. He's going to say life is a virtue, it's a value, and God has a high value place on life. As Christians, especially as evangelicals, we, we, we are pro-life. That's one of the things that, that, that we see largely uh, embraced by evangelical churches. And pro-life in, in that terminology means that we're uh, against abortion, we're in favor of, of life beginning at the point of conception. But the truth is, uh, pro-life can mean a lot more than that, right? It doesn't naturally mean more than that, but it can mean more than that. Life is valuable. And so when we see living people in hurting and pain and trouble, we're in favor of those people. When we see children without families, we, we seek out those children because we're in favor of those who are living. When we see our fellow man who's beaten down and downtrod, we're in favor of that person. As Doc prayed for those people who can't kick the habit, when we see people who are struggling, addicted, addled with all sorts of sin problems, we don't dispose of them, we go to them, right? We seek out those who are hurting because they're valuable, because life matters. Human life is of the utmost importance to us and to God. Let me read a little bit in Genesis chapter 9, and then we'll talk a little bit, and we'll read a little bit more. It says, And God blessed Noah and his sons, and he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground, and on all the fish in the sea. For into your hand they are delivered." Every morning, a moving thing that lives shall be for food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything now. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, uh, that is, its blood. And you shall, and for your lifeblood, it will be, require a reckoning. From every beast I will require it, and from man, from his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Verse 6 says, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. So God is releasing Noah and his family onto this new world um, that has been cleansed of everything that was unrighteous in it. And he begins by laying out some general principles that are going to happen. He starts with a command um, that needs to be fulfilled. And it's be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. This, this principle of be fruitful and multiply uh, was given to Adam and Eve in the garden. They were supposed to be fruitful and multiply. It's part of our human nature, right? We, we're, we're, we're like God in that we're creative, except we're procreative, right? We, we make little people to go out and to multiply. And the more we have, the more they have. And the human race expands through uh, this, this be fruitful and multiply 
command. But it doesn't just stop at multiplying. Some of us are really good at this multiplication thing. My wife has six kids, right? She has six kids by like four different dads or something. It's crazy, by the way, my <laughs> wife here. Um, we've adopted several, just so we're, just to, you're like, man, that woman, right? Just so you know our, our story, right? Um, all right, it's, a, it, it, it's crazy. Uh, it's crazy. Some of us are really good at this multiplication thing, or we seek out those who need homes, right? But it's not just about adding people. It's about adding people who can give dominion, God's dominion, around the world. God says, multiply and fill the earth. I'm not going to preach uh, all the way to the Tower of Babel, which is like in Genesis 11, uh, but one of the reasons that the Tower of Babel is a problem for God is that God says, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And instead, people were fruitful, multiplied, and congregated together into one spot. Right? They, they sought to be together, and God said, I want you to fill the earth. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. And then God said, okay, well, I'm going to do it for you. And then he picked everyone up, and he flung them across the globe and scattered their languages. Right? Um, God desired us to fill the earth because we are God's representatives here on earth to give dominion to those things that are not human and so right after he talks about be fruitful be fruitful and multiply he talks about the birds and the beasts and the fish how there will be dread of man when they see us and the reason that the birds and the fish and the uh whatever other beasts that that are around the cattle should be scared of us is because we will now eat them right in the garden god had given adam and eve food to eat from the ground uh just naturally given it to them now, after the flood, he says, this meat is now for you to eat. It's for you to consume, and so animals will have fear of you. They'll, they'll, they'll be underneath you. You will be uh, Lord over them, because you will be over them. But he goes from this thing about animals to a prohibition, right? He says, he says you're going to eat the animals, but you're not to eat their blood. You're not to eat the life. That is in the animals. This idea of eating uh, living animals, right? The idea is like you're not supposed to just grab an animal. You know, I think of like y'all people who like sushi, right? I don't, I'm not a person who likes sushi, right? You're not supposed to just grab it out of the sea and just start gnawing on it while it was still swimming just a second ago, right? Like you're supposed to take some time and make sure that it is good and truly dead, right? You're, you're not supposed to eat things while they're living because the life, right, God values even animal life. We're not supposed to eat it while the animal is still living. And then he turns from that to what is kind of the point of this passage in verse 5. Uh, he says, And for your lifeblood I will require a reckoning. From every beast I will require it, and also from man. From his fellow man I will require a reckoning for the life of man. He says, look, if, if, if a man is to spill the blood of another man, then there will be a reckoning on them. There will be a justice system devised against them. God is here giving mankind the um, responsibility to be judges in cases of death, in cases of murder, in cases of wrongful death. God says there will be a reckoning given by man. And the law that God gives for mankind, the law that we're supposed to follow, is that whoever sheds the blood of man, verse 6 says, by man his blood shall be shed, for God made man in his own image. So it's, if someone is to kill someone, then they too are inviting death on themselves, right? And then the reason for that, the reason that God holds it to the point of capital punishment, of a, of a capital offense, is that he says, for God made man in his image. Guys, we are specially made in the image of God. God values us tremendously. And because God values us tremendously, our life matters. Every life matters. You know, there was the, the Black Lives Matters movement was, was really big like two years ago. It was huge, massive movement. Colin Kaepernick, some of y'all still won't watch the NFL because you're mad at Colin Kaepernick, right? And, and what Colin Kaepernick was pointing out was there was injustices in the world that he had lived and been around, okay? And you can, dis, you, you can disagree with his method for bringing that out, but he was trying to point out injustices. As believers, we should seek injustice and then seek to find just ways forward. 
That doesn't mean we endorse what people do necessarily all the time when they do things that's um, wrong-headed and, and wrong-directed. But the truth is, when there's injustice, we should seek justice. But it's not just about one race's life that matters over others. right? It's not that, that this specific type of life matters more than others. Black lives matter more than others, or unborn lives matter. You know, you'll have people who are virulently anti-abortion. I mean, like, as pro-life as you can get, looking to prosecute doctors who perform abortions, looking to prosecute mothers who, who engage the abortion services of an, of an abortion provider. You have this, this whole movement that, that, that's there, right? I'm, 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 I'm with you there. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm against abortion, pretty, pretty actively against abortion. I think it's a, a moral evil. But if that is the entirety of your pro-life ethic, if that's the entirety of it, you are so wrong, right? We have, we have people who are living life in, in all sorts of messed up, squalor circumstances. We have children being born, or we have babies being born to parents who are not fit to raise them, right? And as the church, we have to sense that and see that. And if we're going to tell someone, no, you shouldn't murder your baby, which you shouldn't murder your baby, but no, you shouldn't murder your baby. If we're going to tell someone that, we need to come alongside of them with some solutions to make that possible. right? To make that life that we value when it's inside of the womb matter when it comes out of the womb. We need to be pro-life. We need to seek out ways to make life better. Guys, guys we, we have to be about life because God is about life. Life. God is the life-giving God, and he values it above all things. We are commanded to value life. It's not optional. And that means every life, from the, from the, the embryo, right? I read CNN, right? CNN does some stupid stuff sometimes. Right? CNN uh, wrote like, about this partial birth abortion or born alive act that was going on in Congress. Right? And it was like a, a, a fetus born alive. It was how they worded it, which, by the way, if you have a fetus that's born alive, I don't care where you are on the spectrum, that's a baby, right? When it's outside of the, the mother, and it's laying on a table, and it's alive, it's a baby, right? So, like, we, we, like they have a low view of life, though. They don't view life the way believers do. We can't expect CNN to view life the way believers do. We, as the church, need to value it more. Value it more from the moment it's conceived until the moment that they pass away. There are nursing homes around this county where we need people with a strong pro-life ethic to be inside of those nursing homes, caring for those people who have no family around, who are staring at a wall for nine hours a day. We need to be in this world pouring into these people from birth to grave, from conception to death. We need to be about it because God values life. And because God values life, he commands us to value life. And so we don't look at our fellow brother and sister when they're messed up and drug out. I point over here always because I point to Gills, right? Because Gills is just over here. And Gills is my picture of what's wrong in Rockdale. If we were closer to the budget motel, I would point that way, right? <laughs> right? We've got wickedness and brokenness and drugs and all sorts of depravity. And we look at those people sometimes like they're the enemy because they're, they're, they're fallen into sin and they're trapped in sin. But the truth is, guys, that inside of that drug addict is the image of God. And they're valuable and precious and they need redemption. And so we go and we seek and we save those who are lost because there's no one else who cares for them like Jesus cares for them. And but for the grace of God, you would be like them. You would be there like them, strung out, messed up, family life in chaos. You would be like them. God values life. He commands us to value life. It's an important, important thing. When God destroyed the world, it wasn't a flippant act of, uh, 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 of some insane moment in God where he just lost his mind. He's like, I'm just going to kill everything. Right? God still valued life in that moment. When he started again, he didn't want Noah thinking life didn't matter. He said, look, the most important thing, 
that you are entrusted with, that you are around every day, is human life. And so every person you come into contact with, whether it's the, you know, the, the, the stupid person that you have to deal with at the store, the stupid person you have to deal with at your work. Some of y'all deal with stupid people at work all day long. I'm sorry, right? It's amazing how many stupid people there are in this world. But that stupid person bears the image of God on them. And so we're commanded to value them because God values them. And to begin to change that in our hearts is a daily discipline. To look at someone who is naturally repulsive to us and to say, God values that person. And so I'm going to choose to value that person. And how do we value people? We value them the same way we want people to value us. We we love them. We cherish them. We help them when they need help, and we give them the knowledge of Jesus Christ because there's nothing else that they need except the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ came to earth, lived a sinless life, died for sinners like you and like that moron at your office. He died for them all, and he raised himself again so that we could have eternal life. That is the message of the gospel. It's the message that we share. We share it with, the, with, the, with our closest friends, and we share it with the people who we view as our enemies because God values their life, and we should value it as well. Continuing on in verse 8, it says, Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your offspring after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds and the livestock and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I will establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. And never again shall there be flood to destroy the whole earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I made between me and you and every living creature um, that is with you for all the future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And when I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I remember, I will remember my covenant that is between me and between you and every other living creature of flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I'll see it, and I will remember the everlasting covenant between Um, God and every living creature that's on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. So after God lays out the value of human life, the importance of human life, God says, and now I'm going to come into an agreement with you. I'm going to make a covenant with mankind. A covenant is a sacred contract, right? We enter into to contracts on a regular uh, basis, right? You may have gone and gotten a mortgage once upon a time, and you signed your name like 700 times, and you have no idea what you signed in the midst of that legal contract, right? You just signed with a little tab that said, sign here, initial here, sign here, initial here. You went through it, right? That's a legal contract, but, but a covenant is a sacred contract. God is part of of that contract. If you were married in a church sort of setting, it should have been a sacred covenantal marriage. It wasn't just a contract of two people coming together and saying, I think we can make our assets come together and be better together, right? It's not not just a binding legally together, but it's a spiritually binding together between husband, wife, and God to make this three-corded strand, right? That's not easily broken. But God enters into a covenant unilaterally, He says, this is what I will do for you. You don't have to do anything for me. You don't have any responsibility here. I promise never again to destroy all of the world by flood. That's a a promising thing, right? Because I, I grew up in Houston and I've seen floods, right? I've seen devastation in a flooding manner, right? It's a big deal. I remember the first major flood I experienced was Tropical Storm Allison. And Tropical Storm Allison was like Hurricane Harvey, except just a little bit less. And she just sat on Houston. Right, she came, and then she left, and then she came back and sat on Houston for like two days. Flooded areas of Houston I didn't know could be flooded. I've seen them flooded twice since then, right? But this, this idea that, that, that rain is a destroyer is a scary thought, and God says, look, I'm not going to destroy all flesh anymore. And the reason God isn't going to destroy all flesh by this mass calamity is because as before, before the scales of justice were kind of weighted um, a little bit differently. There was the sin of humanity 
was weighing down and that the righteousness of humanity was, was not weighing down. And God said, we've reached the point. We've hit the buzzer down here at the bottom. We're just going to reset the scales. Right? And God looked at it and he washed it all away to reset the scales. And now God, instead of having judgment on everybody at one time, his judgment is more focused on individuals. Right? It's more focused personally in smaller sections than it was prior to the flood. All of mankind was lumped together in one mass judgment. God isn't judging that way anymore. Instead, God's judgment is much more personal. Right? He's going to judge you for what you do. You will be responsible for your works of wickedness, and you will be credited with your works of righteousness. Your faith will be credited to you, and, and, and that's the scale where God's divine judgment will be played out on personally, individually, as opposed to this corporate thing. And God says, I'm never going to destroy the entirety of the world again. Instead, I'm going to preserve creation. This thing is never going to be totally destroyed again in this manner there's going to come a time when there's going to be a total destruction of the world we know this it's, it's prophesied uh, very heavily throughout the new testament especially in the book of revelation we see jesus is going to come again and all of the brokenness in the world is going to be taken away but it's going to happen dramatically different and for different purposes than the flood had taken place instead god is covenanting to to preserve his creation god values creation he says so so i'm going to make this this covenant with you and I'm going to put a rainbow in the sky. And that, that idea of the rainbow, because like, that's the world's first rainbow that Noah saw when he came off the boat. I have no idea. It's really not that important. But it's a reminder for God when he sees it to be like, okay, uh, the wickedness of humanity is pretty bad. By the way, our wickedness today, 2020, is pretty bad. We're pretty wicked. We're pretty messed up. We're pretty depraved people, Right? But God looks down from heaven, sees the rainbow, and he says, okay, not going to do it like that. And we look up and we see the rainbow and we're reminded that God is going to be gracious to us, even though we don't deserve it. God is coveting to preserve creation and we are commanded to value life. These are the two sides of what's going on here. But look, guys, we as people, we preserve life because God values it. God is preserving creation for all of perpetuity, right, to continue on all the way to this moment right now. God has held the world together for this moment in time right now because he cares and loves us very much. So we preserve life because God cares about it. It's precious to God. Now, now, now this, is, this applies to us right now. Right? It applies to us in this moment because you're going to leave this place and you may be in this place and there may be specific life in this room that you hold as less valuable than others. Right? You might look around and be like, I don't like those young people. Right? So I don't, I don't think we have that in our church right now where we have anti-young people. Uh, but you may be like, well, I don't really like those old people. Right? They're just using up resources and taking up all of my whatever. Right, life in this room, we may have some of that, but really, when we leave this place and we go across my own county to the places that God has sent us, you are going to be challenged. You're going to be challenged to not value life. You're going to be challenged to, to, to see life flippantly. You're going to be challenged to, to, to think that life truly isn't that important and that it doesn't really matter. Because you're going to come face to face with the brokenness of this world. And you're going to see those people who walk up and down Cameron Street, right? You're going to see those people who you, you don't know them, right? You've been here your whole life. You don't know who, where these people came from. You don't know who these people are. You don't know what brought them to Rockdale, Texas. They're just walking up and down the road looking for their next, next way to get through the day. You're going to see that, uh, the, the lady who's hassling you as you get out of your car at Brookshire's trying to get 48 cents from you or something like that. Right? You're going to be confronted face to face with, with, with the idea that some people are not as precious and valuable as others. Right? We hold certain people very dearly. And, and part of that is family. Right? You should hold your family dearly. You have a special place in your heart for them. But there's a general sense that, that we are all part of this divine God's family that's out there. That God authored life. He created life. And so as we get confronted with that, what do we do? 
like how do we how do we deal with the the, the drug out of you know we do feed Rockdale in the summer and we deal with some pretty rough families in feed Rockdale in the summer, some people who've really made some very poor decisions. Right? What do we do when we're confronted with those people? We show them the love of Jesus Christ. We pray for those people. If you have someone in your life who absolutely drives you insane, when you think about them, you either get angry or you become so apathetic, you're like, I don't really even care what happens to them. That is a sign that you have not valued their life. This can happen in family relationships too, right? I've seen this uh, way too often when I've gone to do funerals. Families have been broken, split in half. This, this part of the family hasn't talked to this part of the family for, you know, 55 years. It shouldn't be like that. We should value life. And so, so what do we do? We lean into the people that God has put around us. If you have a coworker who's, who's all sorts of messed up, and you, if you work still, you probably have some of those, right? I only work with like one other person most of the time, and I got one, right, in my, in my office who can be messed up at times. I love Carolyn Benton. She is a blessing to me, right? But she's a work in progress, just, just like her coworker is sometimes right here, right? I'm a work in progress. And so whenever that person drives you to want to to cuss them or to strangle them or just to key their car or whatever it is that you're in the mood to do whenever you deal with them, as I want you to know that person's precious to God. And then you may just have to tell yourself, you know, whisper to yourself, that person's precious to God. That person's precious to God. Because I have to do that sometimes with my family, right? (laughs) When I'm dealing with them, like, God loves that person, so, so they're precious to God, so I need to treat them that way. God values life. It's precious to God. God is preserving life all the way from the flood until this day. And so our responsibility, church, is to value it too. And it doesn't just start, you know, when someone becomes pregnant and stop the moment they give birth. Those are very important. And the fact that we have this mass holocaust of people going on should should truly like stagger our senses that we are so deadened inside to think that 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 murdering babies for convenience is the right way forward it should stagger us as a people but it doesn't stop there it doesn't stop when the baby is born right it continues past that adoption is part of that caring for those who are who are without families is part of that Standing alongside of people as they're trying to get their lives together so that they can do what they need to do is part of that. We have to be robustly pro-life. It's not to minimize what we have to do pre-birth. But man, there's life beyond that. Value life. Every life that God has made. Not just American life. Not just life, not just Southern Baptist life, not just life in your family. Every single person has value to God. He's preserved creation all the way to this point. And so we value life because it's precious to God. Let me pray.